I appreciate y'all having me here today, and uh, it's exciting to be here. One thing that Randy hasn't shared is that uh, Randy is really a large uh, part of the heart behind Baki Graduate University. He is the father of one of our major degrees. He has served and influenced it even before he was uh, on faculty there and continues to do so. As a president, my job is basically to create a platform for people like him to see, and uh, he has done that phenomenally. Also, another professor of ours, H. Spees, who I was just with in Kingston, Jamaica, uh, is watching him run a class. And, and our, our classes are really, our faculty are facilitators. We actually go in and do city immersions. And the way that H. does that, he actually learned from Randy. Um, and then the way watching him do that is just magic. And so I'm very privileged actually to be here um, kind of as a stage manager. Um, for two of our great divas, and so thank you for, <laughs> for inviting me here. <laughs> um, what I wanted to do too is my goal today is to, uh, pretty simple. I would like to help you to stop using three words the way you are and uh, to change the way you use three words. And so uh, hopefully we can accomplish that in about 30 minutes and we'll have a dialogue. When you think about, uh, and, and Randy had asked me to talk about culture. How do you change culture? Culture is norm. When you think about culture, it's not that green thing that's growing in your refrigerator. It's not the people that you know, go look at opera and say, I'm cultured. Um, culture is really a way of seeing, thinking, and believing. It's the water that a fish swims in. It's, and so it's almost so prevalent that sometimes we can't even define it. And when you start changing the culture, you begin to change how people see, how they act, how they believe, how they think, even how they feel. And so one of the aspects of accomplishing what this center is designed to do, part of the job is to change the culture which is being done in. So when we think about culture, um, one thing that forms it is words create stories. And then stories create an identity. And then an identity and community creates culture. And think about this framework. See what we have up here. Yeah. Um, it may kind of run off the edge, so I'll just kind of... That's all right. So we'll figure it out. But think about it. When you use words wrongly, it actually creates wrong stories. And for many of us, when you're working in, um, in an urban community, people hear words growing up as children. You're unwanted. You're a failure. You're not. You're somebody who's stupid. When you hear those words growing up, after a while, they become your, uh, they become your story. And so part of your whole story in your life is, I'm the stupid one. I'm the one that nobody wants. And then when that becomes your identity, it actually starts at that point, it becomes self-fulfilling. And so you act like you're stupid. You act like something is wrong with you. And when that happens with a lot of people that you hang out with, it becomes the normal of your culture. And you know that the, one of the things that's interesting is how powerful words are for all of us. For many of us, it's the words of how does God see us? And when we see that God sees us as a sinner, which we are, of course, but when all of a sudden that becomes our story, I'm a sinner that God is always ashamed of. And then when I have my quiet time and God's always frowning at me, you know, the stories begin to reinforce our isolation. Words create stories that create the identity. And then when we go to churches where everybody's thinking that God is frowning at them, what ends up happening? We have a church that's isolated from God. We can't rejoice in that. Same thing in communities. Words empower stories that create identity and when that's done in the community. And it's interesting, people with the common identity often hang out with each other. And when that happens, it reinforces a culture that doesn't allow the words to be used in accurate ways, to get past the stories, to change the identities and to change the culture. So there's three, three words I would like to, um, to change. Let's start with the, the first one, see if it'll show up here. Um, let's keep going forward. So our words, um, so to change a spiral downward, someone has to change the words. I'm going to try to see what we are in this. Uh, so what ends up happening is if a culture is spiraling downward, somebody's got to change the words to make it spiral upwards because culture creates min uh, momentum. So the first word, you may have just blown this off. Okay, three words are missing or used. I like to change them. Just keep going through. This is not going to work with this side. Okay, first word is work. I'd like to change the way you use work. I hope that you never say, I'm trying, I am tired of work, or I am hoping to get out of work. We'll explain why that is. 
Well, we look at Genesis 1 and 2, and you've noticed how the Bible's arranged. The Bible is arranged in a way in that the first two chapters of the Bible are how God designed it in the garden. And then we messed up. And the rest of the Bible is talking about what happens when we messed up. But then the last two chapters in the Bible is how God restored what he intended in the New Jerusalem and in the city. And so it's important to understand that each of us, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, we actually become new garden creatures living in a fallen world. And we become new Jerusalem creatures living in a fallen world. We call that the kingdom. And when we walk near people, we say the kingdom has drawn near. In the same way that Adam and Eve are here. Full, not fully revealed yet, but revealed in part to be fully revealed later. And so what part of it is, is when we look at Genesis, it helps us to understand what is our purpose. Why are we here? What's our, what's our reason? So we think about it. When Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, they had five purposes. And we know this from Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And sometimes we talk about, we're all about the Great Commission, right? We've forgotten sometimes that there is actually another commission. And do we call it the good commission or the okay commission or, or what do we call that? Well, actually, we can't understand the great commission in Matthew 28 unless we understand the first commission. And that's in Genesis 1, 27 and 28. And some of you have heard of it as a cultural mandate, but it basically says we were created to have dominion over the earth, to steward the earth. And so when we look at what it means for every human being after the fall and prior to the fall, what are we designed for? You know, every animal, every creature, everything has a design. We have a design that has five parts to it. Our first design is we are designed to worship God. And what that means is not just sing. It means that we recognize God is the owner of the earth. We were literally designed to be stewards of what God created. And so what that means is the way we work is we work best when we're in submission to the will of the person who created us. And so stewardship is somebody saying, I don't own this. Somebody else owns this, but I take care of what somebody else owns. And worship is saying, I acknowledge God is good, and I acknowledge my place under God. He's the creator, I'm the creature, and that's what I'm designed to be. So every one of us are born with that as our destiny. That's our image. That's what it means to be made in the image of God. The second thing is we're all made to work. Now, this is an interesting thought because a lot of times we don't see that as a positive. But we're working creatures. Form follows function. We have muscles that re relax and tense up. We have uh, opposable thumbs. We're garden working creatures. Now, sometimes in churches you'll hear we'll spend all of eternity uh, before the throne room throwing crowns at God and then picking them back up again. Or you see pictures in heaven where we're all sitting around looking kind of wimpy uh, with harps. But that's not what scripture talks about. Actually, by the way, it, in Scripture, you see a, a demonstration of what a throne room worshiping creature looks like in Revelation 4, and it doesn't look like us. There's four of them. They've got four different kinds of heads, okay, we, you know, and then they have six wings, and then they have eyeballs all over their body. Okay? That's, I mean, I don't have that. I mean, some of you may. Um, if you live in near a radioactive area. But, um, and so what happens is that actually one of the translations says they have eyeballs in their armpits. And I guess because they got their wings raised up, they don't want to run into each other. But that's a throne room worshiping creature. God created those creatures to worship in the throne room for all of eternity. That's how they worship God, by doing what God designed them to be. The way we worship God is by working in the garden, working in the New Jerusalem. That's what we're designed. That's, that's who we are. And then, and then the, the third purpose is we are designed to work in intimacy. We're designed to relate. And in many ways, as the trinity of God, relating in community, absolute community, has existed for all of eternity. We're created like that. We're made for community. We're not made for isolation. God is not made. God is not made. God is not an isolated God. He did not create us to be in isolation. So we were made to be submitted to God's will. That's our purpose. Anytime we get away from that, we're away from who we are. We're made to work. We're made to be in relation with intimacy. We're also made to make decisions on behalf of God. And if you see in Genesis 2, uh, God says, I created all these animals. Adam, you get to name them. And so Adam goes, uh, okay, we'll call that a porcupine. And God goes, porcupine, that's a horrible name for that creature. I'm going to overrule that. We're going to name something else. Is that what the passage says? 
It says, whatever Adam named him, that's the name. God created us to make decisions. We like to make decisions. We like to make decisions that empower our world. Notice when we start giving resources to people in poverty and take away their ability to make decisions, we just disempowered them. Met a need, but destroyed their image, it made an image of God. We're made to make decisions. And then clearly we're made to reproduce. Our bodies are designed, so much of our bodies, male and female, are about reproduction. Those are our five purposes. Notice work is one of those five purposes. And so when somebody says, well, I'm trying to get out of work, you kind of say, so you're trying to get out of breathing? You're trying to get out of what it means to be made as a human? But we're still concerned that work, that word work is often has a negative tone. So when we get to Genesis 3, we understand why that's a negative tone. All right, good. Um, because in Genesis 3, there is a uh, four-part break. So what happens is Adam and Eve are hanging around. Snake comes up to Eve and says, do you really think God has your best interest in mind? Notice he's already rebelled against God, and he's saying, sure, we know God is powerful. We all know that. But is God good? Does God really have your best interest in mind? And you know he's holding out on you. And if you would just take control and not be a steward, become an owner of that tree, then you could be like God. And because of that, we had four breaks. A break between us and God, us and ourselves. No longer do we have the capacity we used to have. And Adam all of a sudden is hiding from God. There's a shame that's a part of us because that's not how we were designed to be. A, uh, a break between us and each other. All of a sudden, Adam's blaming Eve. Oh, she made me do it. You know, like she actually forced the apple into your mouth. And a break between us and our work, meaning that now work is futile. And you know how it is when you have a day where you've worked and you've actually accomplished something, how great that feels. And you know how when you go on a, a uh, vacation and you detox for about a morning and then you start kind of thinking about, you know, what can I do, you know, uh, is that really, uh, the point is, is it getting away from work, the vacation, or actually is it having a place where you can actually work in a way that's less futile? We look about, I know people that design uh, video games, and one of the keys to video games is they say, especially a certain kind of game, is you have to be presented with a decision every seven seconds after you make a decision. The thought in your head, the way the story is told, that you think that there's more likely that you'll make a decision that'll fail, but when you actually look at the programming, it's more likely that you'll make a decision that will succeed. And it's an interesting way for us to kind of live in a false garden. And that's why it's sometimes it's so addictive, because you're constantly being able to work, save the princess or whatever, um, <laughs> and do so without the futility that you face in your normal life. We're working creatures. That's what we're designed to do. It's the weeds that are the problem. They have created futility. And so what happened before the weeds, when Adam and Eve would try to fix a Xerox machine, right? It would work. It would always work. Nowadays, we try to do that thing breaks. You get that black stuff all over you. You know, before the fall, when Adam wanted to talk about sports, Eve was like, yeah, we're intimate. Let's talk about sports. And when Eve wanted to have a deep, theological, emotional conversation, Adam was going, yeah, let's go with that. And nowadays, we connect to each other, and I want to maybe, rare, I might want to have a deep conversation with my heart, with my wife, and she's going, man, I'd love to, but I'm all busy, and I'm just not there. And then she does, and I'm all busy, and the intimacy we were designed for is something we still desire, because we're garden creatures living in ghettos. This is not what we're designed for. But work is not the problem. It's the futility of our work. And so my hope is, is that when we talk about um, the word work, that instead of seeing that as a negative, to begin to understand that's actually who we are. It's a positive. It's our makeup. It's how God designed us. Work is something we desire. Work is something who we are. Work is something we will do for eternity without the weeds. Work is the way we worship God. And so that's a word I hope we begin to change and start taking out of our vocabulary things like, I'm trying to avoid work and see work as bad. It's our how we are made and designed and be able to share that inside of a culture so the story of work is changed from something we avoid to something that is natural to who we are. And our task is, how do we express our desire to not have the weeds 
knowing that in some day all creation is groaning, waiting for those weeds to be removed, right? That in some day we will be able to work in eternity with joy, worshiping God as working creatures without any weeds. It's the futility of our work. And yet it's the futility of the work that God gave us as a gift so we would not work independent of him. You see that in Genesis 11, Tower of Babel. Notice what they're doing. Five purposes, right? One purpose is to work. They're building a tower. Second purpose is to relate. They're all relating to each other. Third purpose is they're making decisions. They're inventing bricks. Okay, They're reproducing. And God says, if I let you continue your work without futility, you will be independent of me. And living life using four of the purposes and not the fifth purpose, not having death, what is that called? Living life with four of your purposes, knowing that God designed you to have five purposes, living all these things to make a name for ourselves for all of eternity, not having death and not having futility, what would you call that? Hell. Living apart from God. We're not designed for that. We're designed to be connected to God under his will and work and make decisions and relate and reproduce. And reproduce can be a lot of ways. Some are single, some cannot reproduce. It's reproducing often in just how we mentor and, and encourage and, and, and help other people to find vi vision and values and purpose in their life. You see that, and that's fulfillment in that as well. And so what ends up happening is when we say the word work, it's actually who we are. It's futility is what's got the issue to press. When we even talk about the gospel, when you, know, when you think about the gospel, what does that mean? It means good news, right? Sometimes it's hard to understand good news until you know the bad news, right? You know, the bad news is going to joke, okay? Um, but it, sometimes if you say, I've got good news, I've got good news, I'm cancer-free. Well, you're going, okay, but he had to understand the bad news as I had cancer before that, right? And when you understand the bad news, and then the good news makes sense. When we talk about the gospel, the bad news is, is we are broken from our purpose. We're broken from God disconnected from God, from ourselves, from each other, and from our world. The gospel is through saving grace and, and believing in Jesus Christ, we connect with God and for eternity, but we reconnect with what it means to be made in the image of God. We reconnect with who we're made to be. And every single human ever born says, I have an aspiration of how it should be that's different than my reality. And we develop reincarnation schemes and and uh, new age schemes and all these philosophies and religions to say, how do I deal with this gap that every human knows this is not how it should be? And yet as Christians, we say, actually, the good news is eternity with Christ and God, fire insurance, okay? But even better than that, when we understand it in this context, is we are reconnecting with the purpose of what it means to be human. We are the true humanist. And that's a word sometimes we misuse. But what happens is the word work is a very important part of the gospel in terms of helping people understand what saving grace in Jesus Christ actually allows. So that's the first word. Oh, second word is business. Now, when you use business, sometimes we go, what is that? Is it profit maximization? Is it um, uh, shareholder value? Is that what business is about? Is it necessary evil? And a lot of times in these conversations, you hear business is bad, just bad, right? But you can redeem it if you would evangelize people in your business. Business is bad, just bad. Sorry you have to do it. But you can redeem it if you can make money and give it to your church, okay, or nonprofit. Business is bad, but if you close your chicken store on Sunday, right, then you can exhibit something through business. But basically, the underlying idea of business is bad. I would like to begin to change that. So let's look at um, its purpose. So the definition of business is really people using their God-given gifts, because all of us have strengths and all of us has limits, in a way in which we're organized to create value for others. So let's say, for example, um, and I'll give you this illustration. I, my God-given gift is the planter of rice. Okay, that's my name. Give a, hey, planter of rice. And your God-given gift is the grower of rice. So you know how to weed and do all this kind of cool stuff. And her God-given gift is the harvester of rice. And so we kind of look at it, hey, there's a commonness in our names. Why don't we kind of organize our gifts, because we have limits, we're dependent upon each other, and let's organize our gifts and we'll start producing rice, right? No weeds, if we were in the garden. 
And all of a sudden, we got all this rice. It's like your grandmother giving you zucchini. It's like, I saw it. And so, but we're tired of eating rice, okay? And here you've got the, the planter of wheat, the harvester, the grower of wheat, and the harvester of wheat. Two different gifts, right? Or different gifts. They've organized. By organizing, they've actually created a way to steward their gifts and steward the earth. And then we look at each other and go, we got rice, you got wheat. We're tired of rice, you're tired of wheat. Let's exchange the value that we've created with the value you've created. What would you call that? It's business. It's business. And in doing so, we've created something from raw, water, seeds, uh, land, soil. And because of our decision-making, image of God ability and work, we've created something of a higher value because we organized our gifts. That's the essence of what business is. And so let's say, um, so it's the way that God designed for us. So let's ask this question. Let's say, and this is, and you understand the joke, okay? Let's say Adam and Eve were Chinese, okay? And so as Chinese, they ignored the fruit and ate the snake, right? And so as a result of it, we never ate that fruit, right? And somebody said, okay, we don't want to eat this fruit. So they built a wall around the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And now we got 7 billion people and nobody's ever eaten the fruit, okay? Would you have a job? in the garden, and if you did, how would it be different? So I've asked this question in different places, and so first of all, let's start with the pastors, okay? Here you got a pastor, and you go, and I'm, I'm overstating this, but okay, you get an option. You can walk with God in the cool of the evening and talk to God personally, or you have your pastor tell stories about God, okay? I think I would go with the first option, right? And so ultimately in the garden, pastors are out of a job, okay? And then let's look at policemen. No moral sin, policemen are out of a job, but firemen actually have a job. Because remember, no moral sin, but we're finite. We can make the mistakes. So we're building something, and we make mistakes, start a fire, a fireman come in and fix it. So we're not, we're perfect, but we're not infinite. Then we talk about it. When I was doing this one time, we were kind of laughing about this, and we had a lawyer in the room. And he's going, you know, he goes, if pastors don't have a job, certainly lawyers don't have a job, right? And he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. let's think about this. Sometimes they call me counselor. Okay, that's a different name. And as a counselor, you guys organizing your wheat, you guys organizing your rice, finite world, could make mistakes, right? So I come in as an expert communicator and talk about all the different options of desires you want, all the different options of desires you want. So when we celebrate the business deal, there's a greater celebration because I have anticipated problems. I would have a job in the garden. You pastors would, but lawyers would, all right? Okay, okay. <laughs> And you just go through that, but you think about that, how would God organize the stewardship of the earth? And in some parts of the earth, you grow rubber, some parts you grow wheat. You would need to somehow exchange that, so there'd probably be a currency. I had a friend that ran a hedge fund, and he goes, you know, my hedge fund would actually increase the efficient transfer of currency and minimize risk. As a hedge fund manager, I would have a job in the garden. You pastors wouldn't. Okay? We can play this out, right? But think about the term business. What happens is everybody in the garden would be a business person. Because that's how God would organize the stewardship of the earth. Organizing our gifts in a way to, to take our gifts and connect with people that have gifts where we have limits to create something of value. We would all be in business. And so when we think about the term, and um, I'm going to get on my brother's case here again. When, when you say, I'm just a theologian, I'm not a businessman, right? Okay, I'm a theologian, not a businessman, okay? I would like to get rid of that, okay? What you would do is say, I'm actually a businessman, but I use my theology gifts to create customer resource management so the customers are better connected to our values and are better to find holistic health, not just with their muscles a bit connected. I am a business person because I'm about stewarding the earth. Uh, that business is not something we look at as something off to the side that's a negative. It actually becomes the way we organize ourselves in the kingdom of God, in the garden, in New Jerusalem, to accomplish God's purposes. Not exactly the way it's defined in Wall Street, but let's take it back because they don't know the definition we do. And so the word business, my hope is that you would change the way you would see business and see that as a positive. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, now I'm messing with you. Church. Okay. That word. When we say, I'm going to church, 
What silliness is that? I'm going to church. What does that really mean? Okay? Or like um, the idea of, uh, because it's, we think of the word church as a building. It's not a building. We think of church as a set of programs that occur on Sunday morning or maybe Wednesday night. That's not what it is. Even in the definition of our churches, we have mission statements in our churches, and it says, the church at whatever, we exist in order, our purpose is to make disciples. Um, back up one. And so, um, if you don't mind. So our church exists, even our purpose statements. What does that mean? So there's a group of people called our church, and they exist to make disciples. So there must be another group of people that are being made into disciples, right? So they're two separate. So you have like these retail providers of religious goods and services. And then you have consumers of religious goods and services, disciple makers, and they're paid to be good, and the rest of us are good for nothing, right? <laughs> and so and what ends up happening is, even the way we define the purpose of the church and our purpose statement is confused. And that, I mean, so when you think about the definition of the church, it's really Christ followers in community growing together as disciples. It's all of us working together. There's not staff. There's not retail providers and consumers. It's all of us in a process together. And how do you go to that? You don't really go to that. You are that. And one of the things, there's a church in, in Dallas that um, they built their building, big old building, and they say, we really hate our building. Um, and so they're trying to figure out how to rename their church. So they, it's called Urban Community Church, and they said, we don't like that. So what we're thinking about is naming our building Irving Church Park, because they've got a big indoor park that they spread out. And so now we're the church that meets at Irving Church Park. You know, and it's kind of an interesting concept of saying, how do we name our building something different than the community that meets there on Sunday morning? And so the idea of separating those names out actually is not a bad idea. Now it gets kind of goofy. It, you've got in, in Florida, uh, it's called Northland, a church distributed, and everybody goes, who? And they explain it, and then you get the example of it. And that's an interesting name that they've used. But the thought of thinking about naming, using the word church differently than something you go to or something that provides services, religious goods and services for these people that are consumers, to understand the name, the definition of it. And so when you understand what a disciple is, that Jesus sent out his disciples, the term that Randy used earlier, the church gathered and the church scattered, is actually an important concept. And so it's like breathing. You know, if you, if you hold your breath, you die, right? If you put all your breath out and you never breathe back in, you die. Churches are like that. If you breathe in as a church gathered on Sunday morning, and you meet together for encouragement and for the connection that happens there, but you've got to breathe back out into the community. And so right now, we are the church. Now, I actually go to a church gathered in a different city. And many of you go to different church gathers here in this city. But today, today, we are the church. We are here in a process of a conversation in community, eating together. We're not doing sacraments, but we're doing things together in order to help us to grow as disciples. We're the church. When you're in your business, you are with the church in your business. Some people don't go to church. Some people are not believers. But among the believers there, you actually have a church scattered in your business. When you're in the community, we have to understand that you don't just do church on Sunday morning, you're held responsible and you are accountable to be in the church even on Wednesday, and even on Thursday. One of the things, and when we begin to understand that, we begin to understand that the role of the pastor changes radically. Now, in, in Ephesians 4, let's see where we are here. Ephesians 4, it talks about why um, God gave leaders to the church. It was to equip the saints for works of service. Now, what happens is most pastors are trained to only do the church gathered, and they don't know what that really means to be the church scattered. Many have changed, but sometimes that's, that's where it is. Uh, one of the founders of our, our school, and our school is named after four siblings, uh, a guy named Dennis Bakke, who is a business leader, a guy named Ray Bakke, who is an urban studies leader, a guy named uh, Lowell Bakke, who is a pastor who really understood church gathered, church scattered, and a, a woman named Marilyn Bakke, who is a woman uh, uh, teacher and leader. And that articulates four of the key values of our church, of our, of our um, school. But Dennis Bakke ran a company called AES. It was 40 billion market cap, 40,000 employees, 36 nations. And so he went to a church. 
And at the end of this year, he had to do an annual report, publicly traded company. <laughs> so he'd take a whole box of those annual reports, take it and put it on the back table of his church and say, I am operating in my company as CEO, as the church scattered, you need to hold me accountable for what I did. Can I put these annual reports here so you can look at them and hold me accountable for the activities of this church at AES? And he said every year they just kind of looked at him like, okay, Dennis, you know, whatever. Um, and didn't understand the concept. They should have actually opened up it, had questions, what's going on, how's that happening? How does the life of the church scattered breathe into the church scattered and inform us and change what we do here? And then what we do here changes what you do out there. But not understanding that, what does that mean? And sometimes pastors say, well, if I look at it that way, then my control, my importance in the church is diminished. Well, what ends up happening is, yeah, you have a smaller slice of the pie, but that pie is much bigger. So you get a lot more pepperoni, right? I mean, the end result is when you see your task as an equipper of the saint, saints in the church gathered and church scattered, it changes the job significantly. And so when we use the word church, even understanding the word pastor that goes with the church, that word needs to be defined. It changes the role of the pastor. I have a good friend that worked in the church gathered as a pastor before he kind of understood this. And as he was working at it, they went through some struggles. And so they finally got the conflict, you know, the only church in the world that has that. And so at the end of it, it kind of settled out. And so they're sitting in an elder meeting late at night. He's tired. It's been, been a hard, hard half year. And so they're saying, you know, now that we've gotten rid of our, our conflict, we're actually beginning to grow. We need some new land. We're landlocked. And he said, well, pastor, what should we do? Tired. And he goes, I don't know. And he goes, well, you know, what would your, you know, should we go buy some more land? Should we try to buy the land next to us? And he goes, I don't know. And he said, well, ask your buddy Lyle Shower, who's a friend of his. Could you tell, ask him what he, he would know. I don't know. I'm tired. I'm going home. So they leave, and the elders of this church are looking at each other and goes, he doesn't know. No, he doesn't know. That's one of the first times that he, they realized he didn't know. And they look at each other and they go, wait, wait, wait a second. You're a commercial real estate developer in this area, aren't you? Well, yeah, that's what I do in my life. And you're the owner of a bank. Yeah, that's what I do. And you're the owner of a, a, a television uh, sports network. That's what I do. And so, and you know, it's a pretty high-powered elder board, right? And there's some other people in there, and they go, of course he wouldn't know. We know. And so <laughs> once they heard him say, I don't know, they started creating bond things, stuff I can't even understand, and created a way to buy some more land and, and did that. Well, the key is, is afterwards the pastor realized what had happened. So he goes, you know, you have this management by uh, walking around, okay? I call it now management by I don't know. <laughs> and it's not I don't care. But my compulsion to have to meet everybody's needs, my compulsion to have to be the hero, my compulsion to have to be the guy who's always got the answer had to be released so I could say, I don't know. So the gifts of the body in this bigger role of understanding the church gathered and church scattered could be released. But I had to begin to say, I don't know. I had to change my identity. I had to change the use of the word church to understand who I was and what I am overseeing. And so part of it is the job is different. Um, and part of it is, is we understand the word differently. And so the, our hope is that we would have pastors who equip for the church gathered and scattered, and we would have leaders in the church who help their pastors do that. Change the way pastors are measured, and they take initiative in the church scattered and in the church gathered to help this occur. Now, there's some examples of where that's happened. And um, let's see where we are on this. Um, I'm going to go past that. That's a way to change culture inside, but let's not stay there. So the, our vision is pastors who equip for church gathered, leaders who purposely serve in the church gathered and scattered, and people who worship in their work, uh, meaning that they understand their work is worship. For example, I was uh, seeing somebody who's a janitor, uh, and we're sitting there walking through the halls, and he said, whoa, stop. And he sprayed something or something on the wall. He sprayed it down, and he goes, ah, I just worship God. Go, okay, what's that about? Okay, and he goes, God wired me and made me to see imperfection. I'm just wired. I see that scratch. You didn't even see it. I didn't see it. You know, I saw it. And I have a job that I got this thing. I can take it down and, and wipe it off. I am doing what God made me to do. Praise God. That is worship, right? That's worshiping, and people that begin to see their work that way. 
Another, another person, another company, you walk in and there's a cubicle that has all the cartoons and their life at the party, right? And she goes, my job in this, I get work done, right? But I also create a culture. God made me to be able to create culture by my personality. I worship God by being the person who creates the culture of joy in this, this whole office. Most of the people who don't even know who Christ is. We begin to see that's not something we do outside of church. It is the work of the church in worship of God, using our gifts to accomplish God's purposes. Because if we were in the garden and that tree had never been eaten, we'd be doing that throughout the whole earth and every, every well. Church defined differently. Let me give you a couple examples here and then we'll stop for conversation. Windsor United uh, Methodist Church. Uh, interesting, this is Kirby John Caldwell, who's the pastor of this, but it's a community. And this is an interesting guy. He is a pastor. He uh, went to Wharton Business School, right? And a theologian. So he's a theologian who's a business person, a business person who's a theologian. And so what he did is he said, um, I realize there's some needs in my community. So he found what they call a super Walmart, a super Kmart. And basically it was put in the wrong location so they could never make it. So he just bought it, 104,000 square feet and created a business incubator in it for people to come in and create all kinds of businesses in that, incubated the work until they grew and outgrew it and moved elsewhere, and has continued to do that. Now, what he did as a church is he recognized the purpose of a church is different than the purpose of an organization. And we teach an organization, for-profit, non-profit, same purpose. The purpose is steward the earth. Some are sustained by gifts and donations. Some are sustained by, by profits. They're the same purpose. And so he created these kingdom corporations to build this incubation center. He also built a neighborhood called the Corinthian Point. It has 220 acres, 462 homes, $173 million it took to develop that with Ryland Homes. The idea being, and then move people in there of a variety of different economic structures, different needs, and created a, a neighborhood that has different parts of it that he felt like reflected what it means to be the kingdom revealed in part now, to be fully revealed later in the New Jerusalem has a couple of schools. One he actually manages for the Houston Independent School District, actually manages their school. And the name of the school is called Leaders High School for Business and Economic Success. Um, phenomenal illustration. And early on he said, I would like to make a statement to my whole city that I love my city. But Houston, Texas, if you've ever been there, it's really spread out. And you have one downtown, and then you have another downtown way off in the distance. You got another downtown. Just, there's no, um, there's really not any zoning. And so people just pop stuff up everywhere. And so you end up having these little downtowns all connected by these massive freeways that nobody can drive on because they're just crowded. So he goes, there's no thing that connects our city because there's little communities and everybody has an identity, different name, except in Texas, our football team. So he went to the football owners. This is when they were called the, the Oilers. And he said, I want to be on your board. I want to be an owner. And the guy goes, okay, what do you got? I don't got any money, um, but I can put some in. So he invested a little bit to become a co-owner, a little tiny share of the Houston Oilers. And with that, he became visible. Of course, African-American, that was kind of important for what the Oilers were trying to do. And at that point, he allowed him to be somebody who loved the city by being a co-owner of the only thing that the city could agree on, and that's their football team. And uh, most of the time they don't agree on that anyways. But, but said, my job as a pastor is to proactively, utilizing business, utilizing church, utilizing and understanding nonprofits, is to love my city. And he's just continued to empower people in his congregation that way. One more example is, uh, and I'm giving you some big examples, but frankly the more powerful ones are the ones you've already heard this morning that are local. I mean, that's, these are just to kind of expand a vision to see what could happen. Peoria, Illinois. Okay, this is an interesting story. Pastor sitting around, urban pastor going, I need something to help my, my urban community. I'm poor, they're poor, nothing's happening here. We're stuck. And so he goes, and so he started thinking about his relationships. Remember the key to business is having relationships, having something of value. So he said, you know, I know the farmer who owns the land right by our river, you know, acres and acres and acres. I know the mayor, and I'm trusted by the city government. I know the hospital here, and trusted by them, because I'm a chaplain there and know the people there. I know the, the, the community college here, and I'm trusted by them. And I know some people that are developers. There's no way that group will ever talk to each other because they don't have a trusted person to put them together except for me. So he, went to the, he thought it through, he went to the farmer and said, would you be willing to sell at a discount your property 
knowing that eventually through tax incentives you would get the full fair value of the property, but it would come later if we came up with an idea. And he goes, yeah, I'd love to do that. Then he went to the mayor and said, would you, if we started doing this, would you be willing to advocate for federal, uh, some, some, some tax breaks and also some local tax breaks? The mayor goes, yeah, that's a great idea. Went to the community college and the hospital and said, if we did this, would you put something on that location? Yes. Went to the developer and said, could you help me make this work? All of a sudden, it's $150 million first phase, right, to redevelop the land, and it is employing 2,000 people just to move the dirt, right, okay? And then another 2,000 to build it, and then eventually it'll be ongoing employment of 1,000 people that were not employed beforehand, putting profits back that he could build other businesses in the urban center. And think about it, the only person who could be a broker of that deal was not the investment banker, it wasn't the politicians, it wasn't the developer, the only person who had the relationships to do that was the pastor and understood that, that those relationships translate into business value. Business defined as organizing people's gifts to accomplish something that's of higher value as a result of that. It's a vision and yet that's what, that's what we have here. So let me move there to questions. Um, remember, words create stories Stories create personal identity. Identity and proximity and community creates a culture. And then culture shapes everything that you believe, you see, and you do. So let's look at some questions for discussion. And we've got until, we've got 10 minutes, uh, until 10.10. And what I'd like you to do is break in groups of two or three. And specifically, remember that when you talk about needs, needs drive vision, vision drives solutions. And so we're going to talk about needs. Meaning if you talk about a vision but you haven't connected to a need, nobody knows what you're talking about. But when you start with needs and you have a common need, then you start developing a common vision. That vision then creates an opportunity for solutions, very specific. So when you think about your setting, you're a business person, you're a community organizer, you're a church pastor, you're in a church, what I'd like you to do is start with yourself, and you can kind of do whatever you want to in terms of this, but probably ideally with yourself. How are you using stories and words in your own life? Uh, distancing yourself from being a business person. Distancing yourself, uh, perhaps using church in a more narrow way. What are you doing in your own internal story that's keeping what Randy is casting a vision for from happening? Then, what's happening in your organization that's keeping that from happening? And then many of you serve people in at-risk neighborhoods and communities. What's happening in their story? The way they use words, the way they've created stories that drive their life, the way they create an identity and describe themselves that's creating a culture that's keeping that from happening.